I recorded it and some technical issues happened. It wasn't like till later that I realized I did not have the recording of the interview. Little panic mode on Friday. And then um, I thought maybe I, I try to look for it and all that. And then Saturday, I just had ultimate despair. I apologize to everybody. I just felt so terrible. And then I sent a message to Miss Britt apologizing for the interview. And I fully intended uh, for this show to be a recap show about the interview, which was awesome. It's magic. And luckily, amazingly, she said, I recorded the interview. I'll send you the file. <laughs> That's so awesome. Shira, save the day. Yes. <laughs> She really is. A, she really is Shira. Yes. A superhero, you know, Adora, Shira. You know, she was also a Batgirl in the filmation Batman. Um, she saved the day. And so here is the full interview recorded by Melendi Britt. Melanie Britt, thank you it's, for being here. With well, me. first of all, it's Melindy. <laughs> Melindy. Yeah, and everybody gets it wrong. I hear Melinda, Melanie, all these, all these names, and I answer to all of them. But I, I thought, well, let's let's do it right. It's Melindy. <laughs> we'll never happen again, Melanie. Okay. We've had that conversation before. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the first question falls to me. Part of it that we were just uh, completely fascinated with was the history of filmation right and we know you have a history uh being there you know from that girl yeah of course to shira and flash gordon too friend. oh yes yes you were princess aura right 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 i completely love that <laughs> uh, this comes from me and unfortunately my friend kelly edmonds who loved you wanted to be here but unfortunately she lost her voice oh no so our question oh dear yeah, we wanted to know a little bit of what it was like uh, developing your characters. You did multiple characters. Right. And so the question she had was, you know, how uh, did you switch characters? How did it work being inside that recording studio at Filmation? Well, first of all, it was an incredibly uh empowering sort of recording session because it was done like you were doing a film or a, a TV show because we would first come in in the morning and sit all around this great table and they had, you know, little snacks and stuff and our scripts and we would read through the script. Then we would get all our laughs out and all the stuff like that, you know. And then uh, we would go into the booth well, I think we'd break for lunch first, and then we'd go into the booth and we'd record. And we recorded all together. We didn't record individually. And yes, we would definitely do most of the characters that we had to switch to while we were in the booth. Maybe we'd take a pause if, if needed. And, and most of the time, <clears throat> excuse me, they tried to make the scripts so that we didn't have to talk to one ourselves, you know, constantly. So that, that's what we did. Sometimes it was a little difficult. Sometimes we'd mess up, but we'd go back and do it again. And uh, it was great fun. I would have loved to have been there. Oh, God, it yeah. was so much fun. I can't tell you. Because first of all, I mean, I was a straight person, straight man to all of those guys. They were hysterical. I mean, really, they were so funny. And Linda and I were just kind of like, okay, you know. <laughs> but it, it was it was it was terrific. It was a great laugh fest. It really was a love fest and a laugh fest. They were just great guys, great, great, great guys. Oh, wonderful. And I'm still friends with, of course, with Alan. We do conventions together, and I talk to John every now and then. He'll call me up and he'll say, "Hello, Shira. This is your brother, He Man." <laughs> you know? oh. He is so darling. Oh. They're all fantastic. They're all just wonderful, wonderful people. I'm sorry we lost George and we lost Linda. So we're kind of the only ones yeah. left. The next question that we have is, um, how did you develop the voices that you had for the show, Adora, she and Katra? And then uh, how much background information and direction was given to you to make those characters come to life? When I auditioned, because back then we would... Uh, there was seriously, you would go into your agency and auditions. Now, you know, we do auditions from home. 
because most of us have uh, home studios. But we would uh, go into the agency and uh, literally on a reel to reel. I don't even know if you guys are old enough to remember that. But uh, oh, we. I remember. You do? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'd go in there and uh, wh whoever you know was was uh, qualified to do an audition for it would they put it all on this reel and they'd send it over to filmation I think we were told on the first uh, uh, pass of the first audition that this was a superhero character and she was strong and da 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 and all this stuff and I I had worked for filmation before so I I kind of understood the way they did things but I didn't understand you know this particular character because that's basically all there was at that point they just wanted to hear the voice so I auditioned for it and then I got a call back and that was strange really because usually back then we had such a group of voice actors animation voice actors back then that they knew you and they would hear the voice and say yeah that's right for it but this was unusual because I was asked to go in and talk with Lou, and I thought, well, that's interesting. So I went in, and he explained the whole character to me of She-Ra. I could tell that he was passionate about this character, and it meant a lot to him. And so I felt, the, I felt his heart in it, and, of course, it translated into my heart. It made it more full for me. So that's how I, I developed her. Then when we talked about, when he told me about how it happened, how the story was going to go on, that Adora, you know, would turn into She-Ra, then I had to decide how I was going to make Adora slightly different, still the same person, but slightly different, because she had a completely different uh, character analysis. She was, she was a pretty young girl. She was a warrior, yeah, but she was still a, a young woman who was raised and almost brainwashed into the Hordak's agenda and then finds out that it's it's completely wrong and dangerous and uh, a criminal. So I kind of went back to, I was trained in the classics uh, in theater and she kind of reminded me of a Juliet in the sense that she was innocent. She was really innocent. She, I mean, she was almost, uh, she was, must have been eight, she had to be 18 or 19, but she was still very innocent because she'd lived a sheltered life. So uh, that's how I developed Adora and She-Ra, because I knew that when she turned into She-Ra, she almost became, in a sense, a strong woman, a woman who was not bound by innocence. She, was, she could see things, she could see the world, she saw the truth. So that's how I had developed her. For the others, they were minor characters, so I didn't even know that was I was going to be doing any others. We would get a script, and I go, "Oh, got to go! Oh, got to get a character for this one." Mm, mm. Literally, it was like that. And so, but I mean, you know, that was our job. We were expected to do that. And now, the funny one—I mean, I remember one day I came in, and I mean, there was Castisbella. I went, "Oh shoot! How am I going to make her voice different?" And so I, I thought, "Oh my god." All of a sudden, Catherine Hepburn when it came in my mind. <laughs> so I gave her a little bit of Catherine Hepburn for that, you know. And then, oh, my God. <laughs> but it's embarrassing, but that's what I did. <laughs> and then... It's great to see the, 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 that in it. Yeah, and I mean, because... You said Catherine Hepburn. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how I how, how she came to mind. Of course, she had red hair, so that made me think of Catherine Hepburn, too. I mean, seriously, it was just totally off the cuff. And then Mermista, I remember, I thought, she's got to be different, too. Okay, maybe some sort of a weird French accent, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> and then, honest to God, I do not remember what how I did Octavia. I really don't know, because as I say, these were minor characters, so I can't. Yeah. I, and then sometimes I played a little boy and all that kind of stuff. But that's kind of how it went. I my main focus was Adora and Shira. Those were the main ones for me. Oh, and Catra. Sorry, Catra. I forgot Catra, my my other one who I loved. Well, she. <laughs> I mean, she was annoying, and she annoyed She-Ra, and so I may, wanted to make her a little annoying and cloying, and just kind of, just, so, and I, I thought, honest to God, I thought of Eartha Kitt. <laughs> I did, 
And and I didn't uh, do it like exactly like Eartha Kitt, but it was kind of that thing, you know, like kind of a thing like that. Yeah. But uh, I've so that's. Thought that actually. Oh, did you? Oh, okay. Because that's what I yeah, thought. Yeah, actually, yeah. Because when uh, growing up, I used to watch Eartha Kitt, and, and I, I really liked her. I thought she was really cool. <laughs> you're, you're, I want to just say real quick. Your, your talk about talking to Lou Scheimer. Yeah. There's something about now the transformation sequence when I think of how you made Adora say, you know, for the uh-huh. honor of Grace when I am Shira. Right. That makes it even more impactful the more I think about it. Right. Because you've got to understand the heart of the character. Ah, oh, good, eyes. good. I'm glad, and glad, it, yeah. It, like, uh, I just, I wanted to say really quick, and I promise that uh, I'll, I'll stop because I know we're on a timeline here, but okay. the, the one transformation that meant the most to me and, and the way that you did it was in The Secret of the Sword for the very first time. Right. I get chills every time I hear it. Yeah. Right. And I see that moment because it's like she has a sort of protection. She's there to protect her brother, and she's claiming her birthright. And it's mm-hmm. just there's so many things to think up there. And you telling that story about Lou taking you aside and giving you that yeah. extra treatment, like yeah, that that makes it even more rich to it, it, hear those lines now for me. Yeah, I mean the whole series it makes it more rich because that was a, that was a series that Lou really really had his heart invested in. He really did. He fought for that series. Thank you. Well, you know, I really wanted to to ask you this question, which is, uh, you know, could you please give us your your perspective on the show's reception, the She-Ra show's cartoon's reception, and what expectations did you have on the show's success? I was, uh, you, you know, we didn't really know how it was going to be received. I loved it. I thought it was great, and I, I was so happy that they had a female superhero, you know, coming out. And I love the idea of her connection with her tw- twin brother. I just thought it was just full of love and, 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 and fun. I had no idea. We, I remember going to the premiere of the movie and thinking, well, this is great fun. But I had no idea it would be as loved 35, how many years after? I had no clue, none. I really didn't. And and it's just... I assure you, love. Yes, love. yeah. I mean, I, I, I was talking to my daughter the other day, and uh, we were talking about something, and I was saying, you know, you come to a point in your life where you say, you hope that you've done something that has added something to people's lives when you leave this planet and that you hope you've left it a better place. And I think with that series, that was accomplished in a lot of ways. <clears throat> Excuse me. My voice, I'm losing my voice. But yeah, I, I, I think that that was accomplished in a lot of ways because it had a lot of moral values, had fun. It, it gave people, kids, some place to relax their mind into hope and joy and uh, uh, the good things of life. I, I'm really proud of it. I'm really proud that I was blessed to do it. And it's a timeless show, too. Yeah, that's because it has the heart. Our last major question that I'd like to ask you was, what is your thoughts about the new animated Shira series on Netflix, and how would you compare the portrayal of the original Shira character to the new Shira on Netflix? Well, my thoughts about the new one is that it's not Shira. It's not our Shira. It has... <laughs> No, no, it isn't. It, no, but it isn't. I mean, it, there's nothing. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a good series, I'm sure. I watched a few of them, and I thought, well, this will, this will, you know, this will sell. But it's not our Shira. It, it's a different. And, and in fact, I wish they hadn't used that name, because this Princess of Power is just a totally different character. She doesn't have the same uh, background. None of it. It's not the same. So I, I don't. I really don't consider it the the original Shira, but people can take a name and do whatever they want to with it. You know, not every na- everybody's named Mary or anything else. You know, it's not our Shira. It's still a good series, and uh, I did watch the you know when she does her transformation thing. It doesn't have any of the of what I was trying to convey. Just as you know, we talked about earlier uh, in this conversation about how she was able to lose her innocence in that sense and go into seeing the reality of things. It's just a, 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 mature, a more mature perspective of the world. 
So it's not, to me, it's just not the same series. And it's a, I love the coloring and all that stuff and the music I liked, but I honestly only watched three. So you don't feel like it's fair comparison to compare the Netflix series? I don't think we can compare it. No, I don't think we can compare it. It's a totally different kind of series. I mean, they took some, a few things, but I think they say in, in uh, writing a script or something, there are really only seven uh, storylines. And, you, you know, they take the storyline and, and make it into a different one, a different one, a different one. Well, that's kind of, to me, what they did here. They took this character and made a totally different thing about it. They have the, uh, well, they have the, the rights to do whatever they want to with that name, but they've taken it and done whatever they want to with it. They did not keep hold on to the original stuff, to me. And maybe I'm wrong, because I seriously only watched three. And I want to add just a quick little snippet that what you said, you know, struck a chord because I have a, an adult daughter now. Oh. She's in her 20s. Uh -huh. And back, you know, when she was little, there was no, ma you know, Master of the Universe went in a low. Right. And I showed her the, the She-Ra cartoons. Uh -huh. And she enjoyed them as a little girl, you know, back in the 90s. Right. She enjoyed them. And then she saw the new ones. And she gave the best analogy to me. What she, she said? said? That when she was little, that when she was little, she felt that Shira was her friend. Uh huh. That when you spoke, it was inspiring. Oh. That she wanted to be like you. Yes. You know, yes. Your voice. Part of that, she said, was your voice. Your voice Aww. sounded friendly, <laughs> but yet a hero. And she, she, because she saw the new ones, and she was kind of like. Yeah, this new one doesn't sound like your friend. I see like, what, yeah, I, I see what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, that's what my daughter said, and I, I completely, when you were saying it, I, I completely vibe with it, that we did lose something. Yeah. And I think, yeah, you contributed to, like, love, and I have to realize, I just realized that, yeah, I don't see the love. Mm -hmm. I think that's you what know? makes something classic, and that, and if you don't have the heart, if you don't have the love, you don't have it. That's what makes something classic. That's what makes something live. Well, I mean, earlier this week we learned that Kevin Smith acknowledged in an interview that Shira will need to play a role in his new Masters of the Universe Revelation animated series that he's developing for Netflix. Hmm. He also indicated that the show's design would be very close to the filmation He-Man and Shira cartoons. So my question is, would you be interested in reprising your role as Filmation Shira and Adora in this new series? It depends. Seriously, again, it, now that I've seen what happened with the, with the storyline of the old series as uh, compared with the new one, I'd have to see what it was about. Because I, I right. just do the voices. I don't write it. So right. I'd, have to, I'd really have to see what it was about. Yeah, because you don't want to be misrepresented. No, don't I don't. And I, I, as I say, I love this character. And unless she's done the way it was done, I don't particularly want to do it. All right. Yeah, that makes, sure. sense. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 I mean, I want her to live on. I, I mean, they can have as many she as they want. But I want this one to stay. Uh, no, really. I, I, I want this one to stay as pure to what it was as possible. I mean, we'll always have the DVDs. <laughs> I mean, we'll always have Paris, but we'll always have DVDs. <laughs> right. May I ask another small question? Sure. Uh, how do you feel about She-Ra in a multiverse perspective since the Multiverse Master of the Universe comic just came out? Meaning, how do you feel about different iterations of She-Ra across a universe? I really don't know. I mean, I, I haven't seen any. Well, it's an idea that, that's just been introduced where uh, Masters of the Universe exists in different dimensions, like the Filmation dimension exists along with, like, the Barbarian Violet one, along with the movie one, you know, which goes to the other question, you know, if they do, like, a, a crossover one, you know, would, would you be willing to reprise she -Ra? To let's say your Shira meets the new Shira, or oh, I think that well, but but how could but see how could the old Shira meet the new Shira unless they were different? Well, different dimensions, like reality. Oh, going you know, to a different dimension. Oh, oh, yeah. well, that's 
Sounds interesting. I'd have to see it, but it sounds interesting. Well, Your Shira is speech for that Shira, the new one. <laughs> yeah, no, it sounds interesting, Basically, actually. We want you back. Oh, thank you so much. That's very kind. <laughs> no, well, I'm I'm glad I was able to to do what I was able to do. That's all I can say. But but thank you for 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 saying that. Does sound interesting though. And we won't keep you any longer. Okay, thank I just you. wanted to say again, thank you so much for spending time with us. You're so welcome. I'm sure there are a lot of Shira He Man and Shira fans that are going to just uh, really enjoy hearing from you. Oh, I hope so. I really do. Where can we find you, ma'am? Uh, www. What is it? <laughs> Melendi Brett, Voice of Shira, Princess of Power. That's on uh, Facebook. And I usually, uh, that's where I usually post mostly because on Instagram, first of all, I don't, I don't take pictures. I just don't take pictures very often, and it's such a hassle. And so I can at least on the on the uh, Facebook page, I can kind of uh, communicate with with fans. So I like that better. And uh, then on Instagram, it's at Shira dot Brett. But as I say, I don't do much on Instagram. I should get really try to do that. That's the thing that's hard today. Golly, I sure, certainly wouldn't want to start being in this business now because, gee, you have to market yourself all over the place. <laughs> and I just, that is so uncomfortable for me, I cannot tell you. Oh. But this isn't marketing. This is talking to fans, so I like that. Well, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank you well, so we much. Don't want to take any more of your okay, time. and thank you so much. I really appreciate you asking me to be on yeah. the podcast. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye. All right. Well, that was a an amazing interview with Melendi Britt. Uh, I had a, a blast. And so now let's turn to the news because this was a jam packed week with lots of exciting uh, information coming from uh, various sources about. PowerCon about some great toys and shows. So let's get down to it. All right. Let's do it. All right. Yep. So do you want to start with Revelation first? But yet I saw the video. It dates from August. Well, I. Yeah, it is I'm, from August. Yeah, I'm shocked. It was recorded. It was an interview with Kevin Smith that was recorded right after PowerCon, and I'm just shocked that we haven't seen this before. Kevin Smith, he gave us just a ton of details about and, and, you know, perspective about the show. And so what we learned is that the design of the show is going to be very close to the Filmation cartoon series and that Mattel is definitely working on a new line of action figures for the Revelation cartoon. Well, that was pretty much a given, wasn't it? You know? Now, I know that uh, that uh, Brit Schatz uh, from Mattel, she basically hinted that uh, to Dan, uh, Pixel Dan, during his interview with her at the show. And yeah, it, it's kind of a given, but it's it's so great to hear from Kevin Smith himself that that you know some new figures are coming for us to enjoy. Well, it's always interesting because uh, again, the question is, will they be compatible with set origins line which i guess that's now the the main model there's a little more to discuss on that later but i always picture like maybe they're all going to be together i can't imagine they would make them different sizes and model sets you know i mean um, hasbro does that with their marvel star wars and transformers lines and so it just makes sense that mattel would keep them all consistent you know kids want to play with the toys and they want to look like they're all part of the same team well and given that origins that that whole line is interchangeable you can pull the figures apart and switch their parts around i think it would make a lot of sense just to make it kind of a subline of origins figures at the right price point too i mean 15 dollars a figure is very uh, very reasonable uh, i wanted to bring up the point that at powercon Mattel, during one of the panels, said that the reason why the classics toy line is, is and they used the word sleeping, uh, it's out of the picture for now, is because it would be so hard 
for classics and origins to live on the toy shelf at the same time. So that begs the question, like you said, what are they going to do with this new toy line? Are they going to market it alongside Origins? Is it going to be a subline? It's going to be part of Origins, or will it be something else? Will they make the you know because it, uh, this revelation is going to be targeting a, a, a more mature audience? Are they going to give us some classics figures, some 2000X designs, something new? It, I'm not sure. I'm pretty excited. Um... I mean, this year, like we said, how many times it's a wealth of riches, no matter which way you look at it, really. It's one of those things, though, that there's a lot getting thrown at us all at once, too. So there, there's a certain amount of I hope it all works. You know, right. you, you don't <laughs> want to start investing in something. And then out of nowhere, they're like, well, we got to pull the plug on that because it wasn't selling. And then, like, you know, you're you're left with an incomplete set of something one way or the other, like when Thundercats didn't go over well with Maddie, you know, and there were so many people that weren't happy with that even. Yeah, I'm on that same boat. I mean, they do have plans with Origins coming out. Hopefully it is compatible with Origins or Classics. It's got to fit in one of those two. And figuring they're going for the adult viewer with Revelations, maybe it will be in scale with Classics. I'm crossing my fingers there, honestly. I I don't want to see Classics die out and even take a hibernation. So, you know, I think, I think the main thing about it is let's see what the designs look like from the animation company. And it might actually give us a hint of what way they might go with it, perhaps. Cause True. in some cases, like if, if, yeah, maybe I could be wrong. The more I think about it, it's like it, it, we, we got like, they did the filmation line and that's a simpler, less detailed style. Classics is more detailed. Depends on how detailed, I guess, this one goes um, in their designs because it's animation. You, they aren't going to make so much line work that it's going to be ridiculous to replicate pan- frame after frame and all that stuff. So eh, I, I'm, it, it, there's a lot of good question marks that make me just, just more happy about what we're going to get later this year. So, well, well, I cannot imagine that at the production company there's a Mattel executive telling them we're going to make figures you know let's let's have toys in mind you know it, it's mattel that's yeah. their that's their thing toys is up there the cartoon and all that has to be secondary to that company well when when you look at the shira netflix cartoon series we got some dolls out of it we didn't really we didn't get any actual action figures right but right another bit of news out of that interview is that uh Kevin acknowledged the fact that Adora will have to play a role in the series at some point, and he said that the second series, uh, second season, if there is one, would be a good spot for that. And he even said that we could be getting a uh, He-Man and She-Ra Christmas special, so we could be getting some She-Ra figures out of this as well. Well, that's just smart maneuvering. I mean, there's there's been talk about the rights right now being split. But I think I think maybe Mattel kind of worked it out to get the rights, which is all just a matter of lawyers and agreements, since it's all the same company. It's just uh, it's just weird. I mean, there can be an old there could be another documentary about how <laughs> the rights just went sideways with a company that created that you know property. Mm-hmm. So I I perfectly can see that Mattel might negotiate the Shira to come out on their series and bring Shira back into the fold. I mean, they did it with classics. Remember in the beginning, they yep. said, no, we can't put in Shira and we can't put in filmation characters and all that. And then down the road, here we are. So it, anything's possible. So I, I perfectly just see that it could be in the realm of possibility. Well, and not long ago, um, there was that article in which there was an interview with the showrunner for the She-Ra cartoon, and she was saying that she would she would really enjoy seeing a crossover and a Christmas special. I wonder if it's going to be that, or if they're going to have their own offshoot of this is the filmation She-Ra, like how if they're continuing the filmation tradition with Revelation to that extent, having that take on Shira be that's the version we're getting not the new version the Netflix version yeah it's got to be the filmation version in the relationship which is really exciting 
Yeah, and, and yeah. then that kind of throws that idea out the window from Noelle Stevenson wanting to play ball then, in a sense, I think, because, you know, her version is not filmation, and uh, Melendi Britt definitely made that point <laughs> clear in her interview the other day, which it was it was really interesting to hear her perspective. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm in this mode right now. As opinionated as I get sometimes, I'm just in, like, I just want to see what happens, and it's the craziest feeling, like, I'm not going to be upset one way or the other because we got so many different things that are coming at us. That's like if one doesn't grab me, I'm sure something will. <laughs> so. Right. It would be kind of interesting to see some of the voice actors from the She-Ra cartoon, you you know, playing the She-Ra characters from Filmation in Revelation. Uh, sure. And it's worth mentioning that uh, I don't know if I've mentioned it before, but uh, Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill have both teased on in, on the internet their possible participation in that show's production. Oh, I know. I saw that, and that has me so psyched. Mark I Hamill, Skeletor, I'm perhaps? I'm hoping it were. Mark he, Hamill would be a wonderful Skeletor. Yes. Mark Hamill can do anything. <laughs> He's Mark <laughs> Hamill. He, he it, can do a young voice. I, I've seen you know his uh, different voice work over the years, and he can do a, a teenage voice. He can do a heroic voice. He did Superman for uh, a short clip where he did a wimpy Clark Kent and a Superman. And again, Kevin Conroy does have a deep voice, and we know him as Batman, but he could turn that into a different tone and be a great Skeletor. So that's <laughs> true. I, I'd, I'd really dig just hearing Kevin Conroy do, I'm He Man. Just once, <laughs> you know, just once. <laughs> or crazy idea, crazy idea. Mark Ham, Kevin Conroy, it's too bad. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of crazy that it'd be cool, but it'd be a waste of good characters. I, if I was spitballing, the one that I think I could see him doing, as in Kevin Conroy, he'd make a pretty decent man at arms, I think. Well, how about a one-shot animated dvd of like masters of the universe versus the justice league or something like that i mean there's been all those crossover comic books that's I'm true he could be in justice yeah <laughs> i am surprised it hasn't happened you know with all the uh dc uh comics uh cartoon movies which to me are favorites i love the dc cartoon movies me too uh, i am surprised they haven't done the uh, masters of the universe versus dc universe it's, it's, it's magic. It should be right there waiting to happen. Yeah, that'd be must-own for me if they went there. I mean, I, they don't have to do the Thundercast crossover. Just do the Injustice one. That'd be more than enough for me. <laughs> well, this week we heard from Sony that they will not be making the Masters of the Universe movie, but instead Netflix will be doing it with the same writers and actor that they have already signed on to the Sony flick. So what do you guys think about this news that has just come out? Oh, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. That's basically it, isn't it? Like, we what called else? it? Yeah, people like to fly, throw that flag around saying they called it, but it's always like, okay, so it's official. It's It's going to Netflix, and it can be a good thing. It can be a downside. You know, it, it's a matter of perspective because I want to point out a plus. Netflix has done some high-end movies. They've done some high-concept movies with heavy special effects, and they've done a lot in sci-fi and uh, that genre. They're not doing like the sci-fi channel, you know, movie of the week, which would be a worse story if they said the He-Man movie is going to the sci-fi channel. Okay, that's that would have been really scared. <laughs> yeah, now, that's when we throw in the they, towel. I mean, they are doing a really good job. I know I'm addicted to Sabrina. Yeah, that's a good series. Yeah. So yeah. the special effects, and you're right, they do have that nailed down. Yeah, but whether they've done a movie franchise, that would be a groundbreaking because they haven't done a sequel to any of their movies. No. Well, I think it's fantastic news because this, you know, we've been waiting how long for Sony to make this film? And so I, years? yeah, I have 
you know, I gave up on the idea that they were actually going to pull pull it off. Uh, and so, you know, it's either it's never going to happen or, hey, now Netflix is, you know, going to do it. I'm, and I'm, abs- you know, I'm very confident that they're actually going to be able to make it because, like Renee said, they've they've pulled off some very impressive work. And it doesn't have to necessarily be a movie. It could be a, a, a miniseries. Uh, we'll see. I just find it weird. Like, I don't want to I would avoid miniseries because Netflix has like three things going on with masters of the universe and so i'm kind of like wow that that's that's a lot for like one channel yeah that, you know? that's a good point you know i mean we have which i still grasp that they're doing a, a regular masters of the universe series and then origins and then we have shira and now we have a movie and wow that you know i mean we went from a dry river to drowning in a waterfall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're they're tu- they're turning on the uh, the fire hose for sure. Yeah, basically. And are we gonna have now live action Masters of the Universe figures for that show? You know, for that film. If Mattel had any sense in them, I'd say that they might as well fire on all cylinders and do everything to get it out there. Because if some, one thing doesn't grab somebody, maybe another thing will grab them. But, you know, like it, I, the one thing I like about the whole premise they have going on with Netflix kind of being the caretaker, I guess, is the best point, uh, way to describe it, is at least having them as the caretaker. There's hopefully some quality across the board of, of what they want to do with the stories, what production uh budget they're gonna have and things like that because they've been doing a lot of like chris pine was in the outlaw king movie recently like last year or actually it might have been a year before that and then ryan reynolds just now was in the underground six movie or whatever that was called they're, they're pulling in names for these movies and stuff so you know they they do have this business model at this point that i think you know, I'm not seeing the chances of it failing as hard as it would if they if Sony put it out in the theaters, it wasn't what the fans wanted. And then they're like, well, we're done because this is one once and done, you know, Hail Mary opportunity to make this movie. And that was my biggest worry about a live action movie is they're going to go. This didn't work. We're, we're never going to touch this again. Kind of like 87. Right. That's a good point. Right. But again, just to point out, if if they do pull it off, this would be their chance for Netflix to have a franchise. Yes. It would be good, you know, because they could do, you know, one movie a year. Well, I, I would guess one movie a year with a Netflix budget, and uh, which, again, it's moderate but not extravagant. You know, it's not going to be, you know, Avengers or a Star Wars movie. <laughs> But they can pull off some great stuff. And right now, Netflix, uh, I hate to say it, comparing it to the other, but they are trying to compete with uh, Disney+. Plus. Yeah. Because that Mandalorian series was awesome. And, you know, the, the Witcher that Netflix countered with was just as good. I'm like, wow, I was blown away with The Witcher. And they've done sci-fi series. Lost in Space is, a, is an amazing series they have. And I do enjoy it. I do enjoy Sabrina. I do enjoy Stranger Things. There is a lot Netflix offers that's a plus. So if they decide to do a Masters of the Universe movie, I would hope that they would go in there, like you said, on all cylinders, give us an action-packed, fun thrill ride, maybe not have Ryan Reynolds as (laughs) (laughs) Man-at-Arms. That would be one heck of a Masters if he was Man at Arms. I could do. What are you doing? You know, I just have him. Doing his, <laughs> is that a sword you pulled out? Because that would be awesome. You know, stuff like that. No, like, no, no, he would have to be Orko. Oh, Jesus! Uh, Can you imagine? I, I don't want to picture Ryan Reynolds' version of wearing that outfit because I don't think it would end up being a good thing anymore. <laughs> Although my wife would probably be all about that, and that would bring her audience to it. Maybe I don't know. But, uh, he, he can do it. You know, well, <laughs> no, no, he he can play gritty. He can be serious. You know, <laughs> you know, right now it hasn't quite worked out for him in the movies that he's done it, but he is a good actor. You know, mm. um, another one I was thinking of, you know, William Defoe was in the Black Notebook, the anime that Netflix turned into a movie, mm-hmm. and it was good. And I keep thinking William Defoe, a Skeletor, right there in the suit and all that. 
he he's one of the like I, I I have ranted about this to my wife how many times I feel like there's an alternate reality somewhere where he and Alec Baldwin were cast as Batman and the Joker in the 1989 Batman movie because he to me is the perfect Joker his voice is perfect for Skeletor but I don't know if I could see him at this time being that guy right now he's I mean, he was in Aquaman, actually, and he actually pulled that off. So I don't know. Maybe I should eat my own words about that. But I kind of want to see somebody who can grow with the role and maybe like I don't even have anybody in mind. But a lot of people seem to like that Mark Strong guy who was Sinestro in the Green Lantern movie and stuff. And he's somebody that I feel like a lot of people. Well, he's now the the go to guy for villains with a, like a theatrical presence to them and stuff. Uh, I don't know. Like, well, Willem Dafoe, I just think is a little too old at this point, and that's just me. <laughs> you know, William Dafoe in the Black Notebook movie, he was there and he was in a suit. You know, he mm-hmm. was in the in a mocap suit, gotcha. and that was physically him there. And I just keep thinking, you know, that's how they have to do Skeletor. You know, we we really can't go to the makeup. You know, people would just burn it you know saying that oh look at him it's in a makeup we need to have a cgi mask at least i think if if they're wise and and this is just me coming up with this is if they're wise they'll do like they did with uh chris reeves and the first superman movie where we have this noah centennial and he's uh, he's a name to some but not all he's a name within our community now because Everybody's eyeing him as, oh, you're our new He-Man. You know, don't mess this up, basically. And then um, you you don't have anybody else around him as any support for uh, for him as an actor. It's like start bringing in the names on that. Then have Man at Arms be a name actor. Have Tila maybe be someone who is a name and maybe like blossoming into a bigger star or something like that. And Sorceress could be a name actress that comes in to do something. And um, that's kind of what I'm hoping for. Cause then it'll maybe their support will make him even like bolster him even more in the role. Well, they that's could... always the downside, the catch 22. If you put name actors, they get very difficult to do sequels. I mean, just to go on my little nerds on a couch news, that's the problem going on with Star Trek right now. You know, they, they can't get Chris Pine, Zachary Quinto, Carl Urban, you know, and all those, you know, especially Zoe Saldana to come back to do a Star Trek movie because, you know, the actors got too big. Yeah. Their paychecks are too big. They could always before do tons of Star Trek movies because William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy and the rest weren't like major A-lister, you know, so you got to balance it out. Yeah. And I agree. I I think the one thing I can counter with that though, is we do have three Star Trek movies with those guys in it, at least whereas we only, we don't even have a one new masters movie with any of these new people (laughs) and whoever. So it's like, if we get three of those and then those stars get too big and they want to move on, we got three movies, you know, that's amazing to me, but I, I can definitely see why you would say that. And it makes sense. Um, the other one I wanted to point out, are we still on board with Noah Centrino being He-Man? I could take it or leave it. I mean, I'm sure they could put a CG, like, you know, muscle suit on him or do whatever they want with him. But as long whoever they end up with, whoever's the best part, right? Whoever they can choose to be the best person for the role, you know? Well, I'm still torn because I really don't know Noah Centrino. My daughter knows him. My wife knows him because she's yeah. watched movies with my daughter. Yeah. He's he's not my generation. And I understand that, you know, we got to get somebody else. You yeah. know, somebody has to come in and be that person. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the most muscular guy in the world. Well, they can diet and exercise and, you know, they're going to get those uh, get the Marvel the, the trainers. Over. Exactly. <laughs> Whoever trained Chris Hemsworth, bring him in because that guy had arms. When you see him in oh. Thor, it's like, dude, you know, that dude should – that's why a lot of people are, that dude should play He-Man. And then you have a half of the, the fandom going, you know, Chris Hemsworth should have been He-Man. The other half is like, nope, 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 I'm good with him as Thor. Leave it at that, you know. And I don't know. I am i haven't watched anything he's done. It, 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 none of Me that's either. in my wheelhouse to watch. So I don't really have like a this or that about him opinion-wise. <laughs> 
I'm kind of of the mentality, though, that, you know, even in the Marvel movies, we didn't know who Chris Hemsworth really was until Thor for just going back to that example. And now we couldn't look at him and not see Thor, you know. And so in that way, it's like I kind of like that he's somebody I don't have any knowledge of. And if he comes in and he actually knocks it out of the park, I'm going to just go, you're He-Man. That works, you know, or like Henry Cavill. I didn't really think much of him and now it's like now i see him as as the witcher more than i even see him as superman because i spent more time with him as the witcher you know yeah i'm in the same place as you i haven't seen any of his work he's not of my generation i know that but i'm willing to give him a shot let's see what what he does with the role it could be that chris hemsworth of our franchise where we're yeah. gonna say yes he is the new he-man and uh, I don't know if any of you had the chance to watch like the new Aladdin the, with Will Smith. I watched that a couple months ago, and and like when he comes out, he looks like Will Smith. He you know he he has his moments where he's tangible and he's just Will Smith. But then when he's blue like the genie, they bulk him up using CGI, and it actually right. looks pretty decent. So to me, it's like instead of having two separate actors playing one one is Adam, one is one is uh, He Man. You can already just do some of that. I mean, the Chris Evans thing in in uh, in Captain America kind of proves some of that, and then the genie aspect to me. So it's like, and even even uh, Ruffalo playing the Hulk. You know, I mean, you got all these ways to make this work that we didn't have at our disposal even ten years ago that would look good, and now here we have this like embarrassment of CGI that we can we can push this on him to make it he could look like a mountain if we wanted him to, you know, and. I ah. picture the movie's going to be heavily CGI'd. I mean, I can't imagine, again, another guy putting on a Beast Man costume or, you know, I mean, they, they have to have mocap suits and all that. Yeah. It's just so easier to do it. But you got to give the right amount of budget. You got to have the right talent so that, I mean, the eye, the human eye will look at it and will just know it's CGI. It's just impossible. You know, people always complain, well, I can tell it's CGI. Well, that's the human brain working. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, yeah. it just automatically, it'll never be 100% amazing. It can yeah. get great. And it can get to the point where we just accept it when we're watching a movie and then we go on. Like when, uh, another example I'm going to cite again, in episode one of Star Wars, we knew that was a puppet, Yoda. But then in episode two and three, they did a really good job of making him CGI. We knew he was CGI because we know that's not real. Mm-hmm. Right. And we mm-hmm. just accept it. Just like in Avengers, the first one, we have those aliens attacking New York. They're all CGI, but we just accept it. Yeah. And that's what we need to do. We need to get people that it's not going to be the greatest high end CGI, of course, but we just be have to be OK with it. It has to flow. It has to be part of it. So if Beastman is there, he has to look somewhat decent, of course. But we have to believe and we have to suspend our belief, you know. And then yeah. we roll with it, you know, because all these creatures, all these vehicles, you know, the backgrounds, these, you know, I could imagine Masters of the Universe could be one of those all CGI movies. Yeah, they, yeah, I think that's yeah. absolutely. You're absolutely right. It's going to be heavily CG. I just really hope that they make Eternia really look like Eternia. You know, well, better I'm, than going I'm, back to Earth. Well, oh, <laughs> right, Please right, no. exactly. <laughs> oh my God, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not one of these people who, you know, like as a fan, I want to just get angry about this kind of stuff because at this point. We, we have yet to get a truly good Masters of the Universe movie it, live action. You know, like, I mean, there's elements in 87 that I still go back and I enjoy. The el- the parts on Eternia, usually I'm like, this is awesome. When we get to Earth, it's like, eh, all right, you know, and I just move on from there. So I'm, I'm pretty much like, show me what you got this time around. We, we have the technology, you know, we have the potential here. I don't know. I'm... I'm of a, I'm of how many different minds about it because I love the the franchise. I want this stuff to be carried on to the next generation. Hopefully they love it and they can enjoy it like we do. But there is that part of me that's also a little nervous no matter what because we don't know much about this movie still, and you know we just got the news about Netflix. So once we start getting casting, that's where I'll start really getting like 
hey, I wouldn't have thought of that person as man at arms or I wouldn't thought of that person as Randor. But here we go. Let's see what they'll do here. And then, then I'll really get excited. We also heard this week some news from PowerCon. First, we got some teasers that there are going to be a couple of good exclusives. We have a five-pack of origin figures coming. We have a Shira coming, but we don't know exactly what they look like. We were only given silhouettes of these figures. We were also told of a Hot Wheels exclusive, and the first guest was revealed for this year's PowerCon. It is Erica Scheimer, Lou Scheimer's daughter, who voiced Frosta as well as Imp, Loki, and wrote and sang for the, the oh, I can't remember the song name. <laughs> and it's my ringtone, too. A lot. Just a lot. You know? <laughs> yeah, she did a lot. <laughs> Well, she is fascinating. You know, I mean, uh, she's been a guest at the PowerCon when it was in Torrance uh, a few times. And uh, she is absolutely amazing to talk to. She has so many stories about her filmation, her dad. And uh, you always hear the uh, the love she has for her dad yes. when uh, it talks about it. And uh, seeing her always reminds me of uh, Lou Scheimer, which unfortunately I never got to meet i i do look forward to seeing her and uh trying to figure out what character you know to get her to sign yeah be... i remember meeting her also in torrance lovely lady just as sweet as her father was i got to meet him at san diego comic-con a few times and i am looking forward to seeing her again in august yeah this will be if if i'm able to make it uh, to Paracon, it'll be my first time um, seeing her. So, yeah, I'm thrilled. And, well, part of the reason, well, I I, I don't want to tell Val, no, I'm not going. But I'll be honest, and he knows this, I always hold off because I have to see the goodies. You know, the goodies. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why the tickets didn't go on sale. The tickets go on sale March 7th. So it's after the Toy Fair reveal of these exclusives. And I know it's a hefty price tag. If you've gone to it, you see there's outlines. I don't think it takes much imagination or those who know what it is. Okay. And if we can say it, it's not a secret. So well, the speculation, the, the guess. Well, yeah. But if you know your history, the Masters of the Universe was not the original name mm-hmm. of the toy line. It had a previous name called Lords of Power. And there's pictures and posters of the prototypes of Lords of Power and detective work. Yeah. Plus, also, Axel Jimenez uh, was posting things about that quite frequently throughout the weekend. <laughs> yes. So, uh, yeah. That, that was just super was teasing. A huge wink and a nod <laughs> to that. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, did you catch the shadow image of the She-Ra figure because judging by the bulkiness of the sword i'm guessing that that's going to be an origins figure figure as well yeah she's got the alcala looking sword going on there yeah i saw that i am crossing my fingers that it's going to be an origin shira i am crossing i i would love an origins shira and it's really cool that if that again they made the deal the the things went through and we could start seeing some Shira characters in the Origins line. Yeah, I hope so. I, I would just love to see like a a really good like Frosta. You know, there are some of these characters that didn't quite come out so so good in classics, and Frosta was one of them. And so I'd love to see a proper Origins Frosta, which then we could use, you know, maybe to. That would help us to make some better-looking uh, classics Frosta customs. I'm feeling the pinch because everything they've announced as an exclusive since they announced Origins is the stuff I want. And the stuff that will be on the pegs at Walmart is usually going to be the stuff where I'm like, but I'd really, ha- I'd rather have the exclusive. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> the, the Lords of Power thing to me is really interesting because that to me dives back even further than the mini comics. And there's a certain element of that that really gets my 
that gets my fandom pumping a little more because that era of it in the very beginning still pulls me back into it. I love that aspect. And having the designs looking like, you know, like the Merman looking like he did way back when. That, to me, is exciting, you know? And even the Beast Man, the way that those spikes are coming out of his fur now and stuff, like the original design, it's like, I'd love to see that stuff. But, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm, I'm the guy that you're slumming it with. I don't see me being able to pull this one off, guys. So I'll just, I'll be happy to see the photo. Well, I think that judging by the, the fo- original photo of the Lords of Power figures, uh, and there's a great article about that on the Battle Ram blog, which everybody should check out. Uh, this the Merman design is pretty much mini comics Merman, which is exciting. And yeah. uh, Man at Arms is pretty much mini comics Man at Arms. So those two, I think, uh, will definitely be exciting for us mini comics fans. Yeah, I think we'll probably see a Red Beast Man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you see the original pictures, they they had like a unique design, and I keep thinking, are they new sculpts? Did they like sculpt the whole thing? I'm gonna say well, yes because if you look at the shadow image of Merman, you can see one of the what do you call it the, um, what do you call those, the little extra bits hanging dangly from bits. His, the dangly bits. <laughs> the, there, there are these. <laughs> There are these dangly bits hanging from his mm, his loincloth, and so okay. Nice and save. So, so you can much actually <laughs> see it in the sh- you can actually see that in the shadow. So much for this being a family show tonight. Yeah. <laughs> well, we saw a man clearly with a cloak, a fur coat cloak, which he did that in the mini comics. In the I think it was the first or second one, he he rides up on a vehicle and he's got a cape on, and that's he was kind of cool. On the bow round. Yeah, I don't actually. It was something else, I think. Well, it was no, like a it chariot. It was the prototype to the battle ram. Yeah. 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 It was the Alkaya version. But He Man, I don't think he'll have the wrist bracers this time around. I'm, I, that's why when I saw those shadows, I'm like, what are they going to do with He Man to make him look that much different other than maybe the, the, the bracers not being there and what else? I can't think of anything else. In the photo, he, his. If, well, if you're looking directly at him, his right wristband is is gone. Yeah. But his left wristband is there. Okay. Yeah. I'm seeing the photos now, and I, I kind of see Skeletor. You know, Skeletor has like this – well, it was a, his staff was a stick. Yeah. You know, because it was a prototype. And in the shadow, it clearly looks like it. So uh, – and uh, he has that half leg bracer – you know that it's only the front half that's painted. Yeah. So I'm thinking this is a unique line, and I'm excited about it. I, I am going to get them because I am a completist and I'm an idiot. But uh, <laughs> we all are. I mean, I just keep thinking the price tag. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. Well, yeah, for, for a figure. price tag. For the five-pack, it's $200. For the Shira, it's $40. They didn't yeah. say how much the Hot Wheels was. <laughs> Do you think they're going to do pre-orders like they did previous power cons, Kelly? Yes. They did say on March 7th when the tickets go on sale, you can also do your pre-orders for your exclusives at that time. If you're attending the show, they will have a separate date for non-attending, and they will ship them. Nice. But that will be an added charge. You know, if, uh. you, if you think of it this way, if you think that these figures... Uh, they're they're basically shrunken classics figures. I mean, their heads are, are the same scale. The you know they're fantastic figures, and they're going to be you know made in a very limited run. This is such a, a niche specialty item. I think it, it's certainly worth forty dollars a figure, which is what it comes out to. Yeah. Right. It's basically like buying a, a classics figure. Yeah. I was going to compare it to like those San Diego Comic Con Marvel Legends packs and all that stuff you can't get, especially the Star Wars stuff. I think the thing I'm the most curious about with this five pack, though, is are they going to call them Lords of Power because it's going to really throw it back to the beginnings? I think they will. You think they will? Okay. Sure. Because yeah. I'd be very curious to see that and also the packaging then if they're going to go that route. Maybe they had 
packaging that never was released because they changed it to masters at the last minute. So maybe there's a different way they would have packaged them or something. I don't know. But this, this one definitely got, has my attention. I'll, I'll just say that much. So I I'd heard really like to they see were supposed to be packaging on like uh, the He-Man Prince Adam two pack from last year. So it'll be a special case for the figures then. Well, yeah, like the, a special case for the special comic yeah. that's going to be inserted in them. Which would be a huge added value. Yeah. I heard yeah. the uh, the rumor to it like that, that it's going to be a special box. Just like I hear there's a San Diego Comic-Con exclusive. Oh, but uh, so multiple exclusives in a year. Yeah, we're going to be oh, broke. Oh, man. More than merrier. <laughs> More than merrier for Origins. I, I'm, I can't wait. I want to buy it. Yeah, I'm all in for Origins. <laughs> yeah. You did hear the San Diego Comic-Con one, right? No, what's – oh, uh, what's the – What's the standing the rumor is is that just like last year they did a He-Man with the Prince Adam, they're going to do a Skeletor with the oh, Kelvin. That's right. Yeah. Oh. I, I, Are you referencing I, the German toy show rumor? Yeah. And uh, somebody else has hinted uh, that there's some nice box designs coming. You know, so. That makes sense to me. I mean, you had, He-Man had a shot. Let's give Skeletor a shot. I, see what... And hopefully Mattel learned from last year to make more. Because they were <laughs> selling out within right. minutes of of the con opening each day. And they are very expensive on eBay. Yep. I know. Yeah. I, I had a pass on getting Prince Adam. Now, see, I don't feel stupid because when 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 they announced the Prince Adam He Man one, I was like, well, why don't they do Keldor and, and Skeletor? And then there were people going, oh, but that was just 2000 X. That wasn't really like anything from the vintage line. And I'm like, but it's still but an origin of Skeletor, vintage, you know? Plus, <laughs> That's, in the vintage line, they had the comic of the search for Keldor. Keldor, right? Yeah. Search for Keldor. Mm-hmm. So he was actually introduced in the original line just because he didn't have a figure doesn't no, mean he wasn't well part they of were it. planning to make an original figure of Keldor. Unfortunately they ended the line of Master Universe just before they were able to produce him in the next wave. Has well, any think, pictures of him has showed up? Like the I know he didn't get the prototype obviously but I've were there any designs? Any no not I that I'm aware of I know they they've discussed it at panels and all that saying that Keldor was there but they were going to do that mix and mash uh line you know with slamurai and lord grasp and all those other ones which was a kit bash line and then mm-hmm. they were going to do some new characters but i don't even think they they actually drew i don't even think they realized that Keldor was going to be blue and and all that you know that came from the 2000x yeah so it's always hard to see. You know, I mean, it was always like an idea, Keldor, because they mentioned him, mm-hmm. you know, in the mini comic. But we wondered where he was going to be at or what was well, he? You know, that was always the mystery in that mini comic that never got finished. Exactly. <laughs> well, actually, they did complete it in the uh, Masters of the Universe uh, Classics collection with the mini comic that explained uh, Keldor's origin, Skeletor's origin. Yeah. Yeah, but that was. Again, the updated. Yes, one. but it was supposed to be a continuation, from what I understood. Well, I think the thing with this line, especially with it being branded Origin, like there's different origins along the way and all this kind of stuff. So there are so many people that are like, oh, it's all vintage. It's all going to be Alcala and the mini comics. But then there's origins that happened along the way that you can accept, like Keldor. But here we are going, you know, it, it, most people are thinking in their their scope of it it has to all go to the original stuff so the whole keldor thing wasn't even there until later in the mini comic but to me it's like no that was a legit here's the origin of skeletor at least you know so that's why i thought it made well in my view since we have the uh multiverse comics out now and we've been exploring skeletor's origins in different multiverse versions of himself it kind of makes sense to me that it's going to be multiversal in the origin line for different characters for their origin yeah and the other thing too is mattel owns the rights to the 2000x stuff whereas the filmation and everything else it was kind of you know wonky with how all that worked out so it's like i think they're clinging to that stuff no matter what and saying but this is what we want to do with it going forward they did it with classics and now i think this makes sense too with the next step 
with how this is going. Well, I think I, I personally think that you know when Origins was first announced and the, there was the two pack, every uh, quite a lot of people thought that the whole line would be focused on the mini comic character. And yeah. Of course, that that wasn't that didn't turn out to be the case. And with this uh, r- rumored, li- you know, this list going around from the German toy show. Uh, I'm taking that with a huge grain of salt. In the list is a a mail away faker. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's that's I'm you know makes me very skeptical. Uh, I think that you know the fact that it lists a uh, you know a few things that are that are just I, I think that some of the stuff is just like really low hanging fruit like the Keldor Skeletor True Pack. I mean that's kind of a an easy thing to guess but then again we may not get you know that may not be in the works we may get something totally different well a mail away faker is not out of the realm of crazy you know i mean you know when this line they're trying to launch it they're trying to be big it kind of makes sense they would kind of go back to the old styles and have like offer some exclusives offer some different versions and so when I saw that it was a mail away faker, I'm like, okay, you know, they did it before with 2000X. You know, it's it's completely possible since it's basically a kit bash figure. And the other ones, you know, I mean, again, a Keldor, it's not crazy. Again, this is all, like you said, a grain of salt. We'll know next, actually not next month, will we? We'll know in like in a week, won't next, we? Right. Uh, next weekend, well, this Saturday is when uh, Toy Fair opens. I'm not sure which day Mattel's uh, panel is. It's normally either Saturday evening or Sunday morning when Mattel has their collector's panel. So we have to be paying attention to Pixel Dan or Alternative Minds for information. And, of course, everything is going to be on adultcollector.org. And nerds on the couch. (laughs) Well, of course, nerds on the couch uh, shares everything. We're associated with uh, Action Figure News Insider and uh, Toy Arc. So, you know, all the latest nerd news will be uh, sent out for everybody. But again, everybody knows everything. (laughs) You know, I mean, we live in that age where, you know, we're, we're scouting everything. And so as soon as, you know, something comes up, it's going to be out there. Our character spotlight this week is on She-Ra, the princess of power, the most powerful woman in the universe. Other names, Adora and Despara. Special abilities, superhuman strength, healing, telepathic communication with animals, assorted magical ability, affiliations, the Great Rebellion, and princesses of Etheria. Her weaponry is the Sword of Protection. She first appeared in 1985 in the Filmtration pop animated series, for the crossover event with her brother, He-Man, and the Secret of the Sword. So, guys, you know, what do you think about Shira? You know, since interviewing uh, Melody Britt, I have to point out how amazing uh, she helped make that character. She truly brought the heart to the character, that's for sure. Well, can you imagine somebody else doing the voice? At this no. point, no. And and hearing her in the interview, it was like, I'm talking to Adora. This is crazy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Figuring back in the 80s when it was always damsels in distress, there was very few role models for girls like there are now. She stood out. I mean, I hate to say it through some of my darkest days. It was going to Etheria with Shira and Adora giving me the hope, okay, yes, women can do anything. Everything's going to be okay. Family problems aren't there. And my friends, we were all in middle school at the time. They were addicted to her as well because it was the positive role model that we needed and that we weren't seeing. I mean, yes, you had Alora, Princess Alora from Voltron also, but this was every day we got another dose of She-Ra. I mean, the toy, I know it was supposed to be a hybrid between an action figure and a doll, but it was wound up more of the dolls you had to go to the boys aisle to get the villains but even now it's like when i'm desperate i look at okay how would adora handle this or how would she have handled it 
one of the things I fall back to with Shira when I think of her was is how she used her might to overcome every obstacle using her strength, but she also found herself struggling with her insecurities, especially when she was bested by Malog. She struggled to accept that loss in that episode. I felt it showed more of her to quote unquote her humanity to humble her somewhat. I think uh, my take on her is uh, in some ways she's actually a more interesting character than Adam ever could hope to be because you have that background of she's kidnapped. She's raised by an enemy, like a huge galactic tyrant. And it it is kind of like the Gamora Thanos thing for anybody who doesn't have the background with Sheer. It's like, you know, she's being raised by somebody who's a conqueror and he's evil and he he's wanting to basically be this cancer across the galaxy. And she's indoctrinated with this stuff. So by the time the He-Man gets there and he's able to give her the sword and show her the way that she should have been all along if if she wasn't kidnapped, it makes her a heck of a compelling character just to see her from that perspective going, I'm not going to let my past defy me. I'm going to let my future be up to me in that way. And I feel like still in both animated versions, there's still story that could be drawn from to tell more tales about how conflicted that might be for her, how, how that mentality is with her. They did it a bit in the, uh, in the eternity war comic, but if you think of it in that perspective, it's like, that is wow. You know, that's a heck of a character arc that, that, that woman has to go through. And at the end of the day, she's like the symbol of hope and the symbol of, you know, protection, literally, because she has a sword of it. But uh, she's a symbol of protection. She's a symbol of a role model for girls and everything, too. And uh, I have nothing but respect for that. I think Filmation probably put a little bit more emphasis on her. The stories, to me, were a little better. You know, I mean, I have both uh, complete sets. And I've seen, you know, the He-Man series and I've seen the She-Ra ones. And to me, the She-Ra ones were always a little bit more fuller. They had a little bit more character, a little bit more heart, you know. I agree so, with you, Renee, because in the Lady Bird pop book, she uh, she came more f- forefronted in those. And it's always a question of who created her, you know. I mean, uh, we had, uh, Kelly, remember we had a couple of those questions at the PowerCon? <laughs> you know? Yep. Where people always said, I created her. I cre-. Just like He-Man, you know, there was always a little controversy behind it. Was because... it Tal or was it Filmation? And then there's a third party. Oh, I forgot her name. Oh, I completely forgot her name. But there's a lady who was at a power con who had a booth and all that and said that she oh, created yeah. her. I can't remember her name either. Oh, I'm kicking myself. I'm sure I a viewer can... I seeing her in the... Uh... In the Netflix special, when they were talking about the creation of uh, He-Man, they talked about the creation of She-Ra. Well, the idea was always there, you know. I mean, they had the the marketing. He-Man was making millions of dollars. Somebody, of course, just had the idea of, hey, let's create a female version to get on the the female market because uh, Mattel, remember again in toy lines that never happened. They had an idea of doing a Wonder Woman toy line that was the same model types that we had She-Ra, and it was going to be Wonder Woman and the Star Riders or something like that, where it was Wonder Woman, and she had like a group of female uh, heroes, you know, with horses and all that too, which obviously, I guess the license fell through or something happened, and they decided to use those same I guess, body types to make She-Ra. But the idea was always there. But Filmation, I think, kind of fleshed her out. And they well, did something great with her. Well, remember, Renee, how um, initially they um, until marketed She-Ra because Barbie was failing so badly around the time that he was uh, peaking. So they needed to bring something and bring the girls back to the table. So they decided to bring She-Ra to the forefront at that time, or create her, so to speak. And there's a logic. There was always a logic there, you know, marketing, getting this and all that. But you're right. You know, Kelly was right. We There was very little female characters in those days. I mean, who did we have in the 80s? We had Princess Leia. Yeah, Princess Leia, Princess Allura from Voltron, uh, 
But most times, as far as being an April O'Neil from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, she was also well, she, out there at that well, time. Well, she came later. Don't forget Chitara. She was late that. 80s. That was late Tila. 80s. All late 80s. Yeah. But and Chitara but it, came after He-Man, you know. Right. Yeah. yeah. But otherwise, you had Strawberry Shortcake. It was My Little Pony. It was everything where very girly girl. Or when girls were in action. And, of course, there was Rainbow Bright. Yes. Jim. Jim and the holograms. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, but, the but one... not where you would have much of a lot of action. Yes, I would put Jim in the same realm as the princesses and Adora and all like that. Because there was some action. But otherwise, it was very, oh, Tea parties is, and let's go shopping. Well, Crespo and I had a conversation one time about how the misfits were worse than Cobra and actually did more damage than Cobra. That female band was dangerous, okay? They were worse <laughs> than any terrorist group, you know, out there. But, you know, I mean, we have to attribute that, yeah, Shira was a bold character that yes she people could say yes it was a rip off of it was a female mirror to he-man a rip off to he-man yes you know but she took a life of her own you know and i'm glad she birthed you know i mean it's a shame we didn't see her in 2000x she was on the cusp of coming out in the 2000x if the series if, continued if if we got a season three, we would have had her in Hordak. Yeah, and it's always a shame. It is always a shame. I mean, I never got her figure. You know, if Netflix is able to pull it off and give us a Masters of the Universe movie, I feel that it's only a matter of time before we see a live-action She-Ra movie. I mean, look at how popular the uh, Wonder Woman movies are. And, uh, you know, but I wonder... If they were to make a live-action Shira movie, a modern one today, would they be able to capture the the strength and the inspiration that the the filmation Shira gave us? I can't imagine them not. I mean, having Shira and not He Man first. And I'll be honest, this is where I'm struggling with the Netflix because I do enjoy the Netflix. I, I've pointed it out, but I always have a hard time because they've mentioned Eternia. They've mentioned Castle Grayskull. She says, for the honor of Grayskull. That'd be would, so where's much, that coming from? Yeah, that'd be so well, much fun if she uh, was given a mission. You know, if she discovered that, oh, there's this portal you have to go through. You have to find your brother or something like that. That would, that would be just, I, I would get a kick out of that. Well, I clearly think that it's a multiversal version of Shira for the Netflix launch of the, the new version. I feel strongly that it's a multiversal version of She-Ra because when they come out with the um, Masters of the Universe uh, He-Man series for Netflix and the Masters of the Universe Apocalypse series, I feel there's going to be a She-Ra in both of those or at least one of those that we're going to see. I keep thinking the end of the Netflix, and I, I, I heard it somewhere else too, so I was like, maybe I'm right. Who knows? But I keep thinking the end of this Netflix, Netflix Shira series is going to be her finding out about Eternia. And like maybe the final scene will be her with her family for the first time. And like she's reunited with Randor. Then they don't have to touch He Man. It'll be Adam, you know, in that way. And, and it would open the door to, and the adventure continues because then your mind can tell the rest of those stories without them having to do, oh, He Man's brought into this world now. But, um, with with uh, Rene, with your uh, thought about Shira, I'm I'm gonna be completely honest. You know, like w- like uh, we already said, Wonder Woman. I mean, I've never sat in a movie theater thinking I would watch a Wonder Woman movie with tears in my eyes. But that No Man's Land sequence was amazing, and that made me believe. Like that was the moment where I was like, hook, line, and sinker, this works. Right. She's this icon. She's a powerful woman. She's leading the charge because no one else can. So I'm one of these people. I love those moments. I absolutely like I thrive on those moments in my movies and with my heroes. If you give me a moment where all bets are off, all the rebellion is saying we're about to lose. Hordak's going to win. And all of a sudden you see Adora say for the honor of Grayskull and bam, it's like 
I'm getting chills just imagining how that would be in like a No Man's Land sequence with She-Ra in that sense. And I'm like, bring it on. You know, like I don't care if it's a woman or a man. If you're showing me a hero that I can be inspired by and that I can truly believe is worth cheering for because I want to see them succeed by the end, you got me. It doesn't matter who it is in that in that sense for me every time. So and and I think the time is really right for that with everything that's happening in the in the world right now and stuff. Um, I mean, that's why they went to Shira first, in my opinion. They they figured, hey, you know, there's so much of this. It, women are are getting front and center with movies, Captain Marvel, Wonder Woman, you know, and there, there's a bunch of stuff happening where people are seeing these heroes now and they're inspiring not only young girls but the women who have sat through years of men have to rescue the woman all the time and stuff you know and so it, i think it'd be a good time to go there as well with her but we do have the netflix option for the time being at least but wonder woman was her own iteration she yeah. uh, had a connection you know well, it's like calling like the falcon you know the falcon is a great character and he deserves his own series, but he started or he was rooted from Captain America. Yeah. You know, and it's kind of just awkward cutting off Captain America and just starting off with the Falcon, you know, just to show a different perspective. That's well, why to me, I always felt like, why is this Netflix Shira saying for the honor of grace call? What does that mean to her? You know? And and that's what one of the things when we talked about it uh, before, I said, that's a mystery to me. What is that equation to her? Because we don't have Eternia. We don't have all this other stuff going on. So it's it's like, what is the bigger mystery at play with all this stuff? But I will say one thing, though. She-Ra isn't Falcon. She-Ra is her own lead character in her own show. And she's she's never been like a sidekick to He-Man. She's always been her own thing. So in that way, her name recognition, her story, her character, like I know there's how many people out there that they know Falcon from the, the MCU movies, but they probably don't know the history there. They're just like, he helped uh, Steve in, in, uh, in uh, the Winter Soldier movie, and then he showed up later on to help him in these other things. She was her own main character, you know, and that's kind of where that's why it makes sense that – If you can divorce yourself, and that's the main thing, you can divorce yourself from He-Man being the bridge to give her the sword, and she gets it some other way like on the new show, you can almost go, it doesn't need to be its own thing. It can stand apart maybe better. But in the case, yeah, Falcon, Winter Soldier, you can't have them without Cap. You know, that's a whole different thing. She-Ra, they're showing you could pull some of this off. The only only problem is for the honor of Grayskull then. It's like, what does that mean to her? What is I, that equation there? I think that the, I'm trying to remember, I think that in the show, she at one point said, and what, what's Grayskull? You know, she brought yes. that, you know, she mentioned just really briefly, like, hey, and what's, what's Grayskull? And it's and again, never been answered. And again, I'm okay if that's the way it goes, you know, and mm-hmm. if they answer it or they show a connection, I'd be perfectly fine if they show that there is a he-man or even again i would be perfectly okay if there was if adam is dead you know if they want to go that route Mm -hmm. you know or again it's a different time that there was a he-man in the past yeah and he's gone and now we have you you know we have shira i'd be perfectly fine with that but the way it was implied you know from noel stevenson and the other writers was that there was no connection. There was not going to be any He-Man. There was not going to be any of that when the when they first talked about the show. Yeah. Now, I think opinions have changed. And I think part of what we're seeing with the uh, six, the Netflix She-Ra show was a success. But even as the show is going on, and I think people have, have seen it or the showrunners have seen it, they've asked the question, where is He-Man? You know, people ask that, you know, where is he? And I still have to point out, I think that's one of the issues that Noel Stevenson didn't have a QA and a at the PowerCon, you know, because that would have probably been the main question everybody would have asked. Well, and and the other thing with that show is I think they have it already in the pipeline so far in advance that that answer probably isn't even going to be addressed. And 
that's I think why they're not like, OK, let's not talk about this because we really didn't plan for that. We didn't think it was going to succeed to that extent. I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Also, to get your up to the minute news on Masters of the Universe, don't forget to check out our friends at HeMan.org and mark your calendars March 7th is when the PowerCon tickets go on sale. Till next time, good journey. I'm Renee. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. I'd like to give a big thank you, thank you, a million thanks yous to Melindy Britt. She was just amazing. She saved the day. She is a real-life superhero. <laughs> thank you, ma'am. I owe her incredible i owe her so much gratitude and so i uh, like again thank you for having her here it was amazing talking to her and i'd like to thank you all for being with uh being with us i'd like to invite everybody to join us on nerds on the couch for the latest nerd news thank you for listening and good journey and this is sean Skavarna. um i want to thank uh melindy Britt. that was a Wow, it, it, hearing her voice was awesome the other day. And uh, if you want to find me online, it's uh, October Sun Art on Facebook. And until next time, guys, good journey. And this is David Clark, owner of adultcollector.org, the number one source for He Man and She Ra content. A huge thanks to Melendi Britt for agreeing to come on our show and for joining us. And, uh, and thank you, all of you guys, for for coming together for another awesome show and uh, just have a wonderful week ahead and good journey this is Rex thank you all for having me again even though I was um, joining late tonight um, it was a thrill to get to speak with Brett in the uh, podcast and good journey this has been a Nerds on the Couch production in association with adultcollector.org This episode of the Council of the First Ones was recorded on Sunday, January 26, 2020. Hello and welcome to another episode of Council of the First Ones. I'm your host, Kelly. Joining me today is my brother from another mother, Renee. How are you doing? <laughs> That's a compliment, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. so I'm doing oh, fine, Kelly. Yes, oh, I'm doing fine. I've been enjoying my collectibles, enjoying my filmation figures and my movie figures and my mega constructs. You know, Motu's back. What can I say? I'm happy. They said it was coming back in 2020, and so far, they haven't lied. <laughs> also joining us is Sean. Hi, glad to be back, everybody. Um, what have you been up to lately? I have been reading the uh, Masters of the Multiverse comic, actually, this week. I, I wasn't able to get my hands on it when it actually came out, but was really happy to read it, because 2000X especially, because that's my, that's my jam. I've said it a few times <laughs> before, but I, w I was so happy to go back to Eternia through the Mike Young Productions' eye. So, very happy with that. Also, we have 